March 18, 1925. Betty and her sister Marie's class were outside for recess. The weather had taken a sharp turn for the worse. The wind was so strong it almost knocked little Betty off her feet, and as the skies quickly turned black, the children stuck to the wall to escape the wind, ushered into their classroom by the school principal calling an early end to recess. The building shuddered, and the howling wind forced the window shutters wide open. Betty's teacher asked the boys to shut the windows and the girls to remain at their desks. Suddenly, Betty heard screams and prayers calling out for her sister. She got no answer. Within 10 minutes, every building was flattened. Everything was gone. Little did they know, at 2.38 p.m. on that day, the deadliest tornado in U.S. history had just hit their school, flattening the city as it passed. Today, if a tornado were to strike, we have weather forecasters warning us, headlines, and even alerts sent to our phones to tell us to take shelter. But back in 1925, these life-saving measures weren't in place yet. People only had minutes to react to extreme changes in the weather. Betty Maroney from DeSoto, Illinois, experienced that exact scenario when she was only seven years old. She recalls the day being unusually warm for March, but with strong winds in the air. Betty and her siblings, nine-year-old Marie, 12-year-old Tina May and their 15-year-old brother Herschel walked home in the rain for their lunch break. Their clothes were so soaked that the kids had to change, but the girls were thrilled that they were allowed to wear the pretty new Easter dresses back to class. The four school children said goodbye to their mother, Minnie, 6-year-old Elsie, and baby sister Ruth, and headed back. While they walked to school, Herschel and some other boys were laughing and throwing their hats in the air to see how far the wind took them. The students went inside until 2.30. When Betty and Marie's class went outside for recess, the weather had taken a sharp turn for the worse. The wind was so strong it almost knocked little Betty off her feet, and the skies quickly turned black as the children stuck to the wall to escape the wind. The school principal called an early end to recess and hurried the kids to their classrooms. The building shuddered, and the howling wind forced the window shutters wide open, so Betty's teacher asked the boys to shut the windows and told the girls to sit at their desks. In one moment, the whole world changed. Betty remembers that she had only just sat down next to Marie when something crashed into the school at 2.38 p.m. The windows exploded as the kids screamed, and Betty felt something in her side crack as she was thrown against a wall. The entire second floor above her, where Tina May and Herschel's classrooms were, jumped four feet into the air, turned, and crashed down onto Betty's classroom. Giant hail the size of golf balls attacked her as she saw large objects flying above her in the wind, roofing the sides of houses, mattresses, and lumber. Betty heard screams and prayers, and she yelled for her sister, Marie, but got no answer. She was covered in rubble, but saw a window hole nearby and clambered out before the walls collapsed. Outside, DeSoto was in ruins. Every building was flattened. Everything was gone. Betty was terrified, cold and her pretty new dress was ruined. She wondered if she had just died. Very few survivors of the disastrous tornado who can remember it would be alive today, but a few first-hand accounts, like Betty's, were recorded. Another woman, Leela Hartman, was only four years old in 1925. In her 70s, she recalled the disastrous event as well as she could. Leela had been visiting her grandma Lipsy at the family farm near West Frankfort, Illinois. Like Betty, she also remembers the day being uncommonly beautiful for March. But in the afternoon, the beautiful beautiful sky showed its deadly side. The weather suddenly turned dark and stormy, and the wind was becoming terrifyingly strong. Leela and her other family members wanted to go into the cellar to take shelter, but her grandma resisted. She had weathered so many storms that they didn't face her. But as it got pitch black outside, something told her that this one was different. With grandma convinced, the family went down to the basement for safety. 
As they huddled together, the incredible noises of destruction they heard were unlike any other storm they'd ever seen or heard. When it was finally over, the family was horrified to learn that they were trapped inside the basement as the door was stuck shut by something heavy. Leela's father, a strong young man, worked tirelessly at the door until he could force it open enough to escape. It was a large tree that had been uprooted by the tornado and blown across the door, shutting the family in. This devastating event, now known as the Tri-State Tornado, occurred on March 18, 1925. It got its name because it wreaked havoc across three states, Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri, spending three and a half hours on the ground and traveling 219 miles, an American record for longest time spent on the ground. The Tri-State Tornado is the deadliest tornado in recorded U.S. history, as it took at least 695 lives, injured over 2,000 people and forever changed the lives of thousands of others. In several towns, including DeSoto, Murfreesboro, Bush, West Frankfort, Gorham, and Parrish, almost every building was destroyed as the disaster wiped out 15,000 homes and left behind $17 million of property damage, equal to $2 billion today. In Murfreesboro, Illinois, over 230 people passed away as a result of the event, a record for tornado casualties in a single community. This powerful tornado was at its strongest up to a mile wide and had winds over 300 miles per hour. No photos or videos of it are known to exist, but it was later determined that on the Fujita scale of tornado intensity, the Tri-State Tornado registered at the top of the scale at F5 strength. A tornado this severe is violent, characterized by winds of 150 to 318 miles per hour. Oh, a power outage. Well, no worries here. Thanks to our video sponsor, EcoFlow, we can weather <laughs> through the storm like it's not even there. The Delta II is a brand new essential appliance that can power up to 15 devices simultaneously. EcoFlow's X-Boost technology allows you to use high wattage devices without fear of overloading. The Delta II is not just a battery, it's also a versatile tool for your home. Designed to have an expandable capacity up to 3,040 kilowatts per hour to keep your appliances running, the fast AC charging with revolutionary Xtreme technology charges up to 80% in only 50 minutes. Being able to noiselessly power your microwave, fridge, or even coffee maker in a blackout is a game changer. With long-lasting premium LFP batteries that reduce internal resistance and heat, the Delta II has 3,000 life cycles. That means 10 years with daily use. Have to take shelter outside home? EcoFlow is portable and lightweight, so you can use it on the go. The device can charge in multiple ways, and even takes 500 watt solar input, so you can always be prepared for unexpected power outages. The EcoFlow Delta II is not just a battery, but an essential home appliance. Whether you're using it during emergencies, living off the grid, in the great outdoors, or traveling, it's a handy and eco-friendly power solution for your family anytime and anywhere. Head to our link in the description to visit EcoFlow's green energy solutions. Now, let's get back to our tumultuous story. It results in uprooted trees, objects the size of cars flying for hundreds of feet, and strong houses being pulled from their foundations, carried in the air, and disintegrated. There is still some debate as to whether the Tri-State Tornado was only one tornado or many tornadoes acting as a cluster. At the time, storm analysis techniques were not as advanced as they are today, and technology like radars and satellites weren't available. The surveys of a few Weather Bureau officers at the time suggest that this event was one single deadly tornado. But some modern meteorologists disagree. Tornado expert Thomas Grizzulis believes that the first 60 miles of the tornado track were the work of two or more tornadoes, with the main tornado causing a 157-mile track. Another examination from the Electronic Journal of Severe Storms Meteorology did not have definitive conclusions, but also supports the idea that most of the event was a single tornado about 174 miles long. The report suggested that some damage on either end of the track was caused by separate tornadoes.
By now you might be wondering, how does such a powerful and destructive force even happen? Well, to create a tornado, first you usually need a thunderstorm, which requires an upper layer of cold, dry air and a lower layer of moist, warm, and unstable air. Thunderstorms occur along the warm side of the line that separates the layers, and the level of instability depends on the contrast in temperatures. For a tornado to form, you need a certain type of wind called a veering wind, which turns as it increases in height. Veering wind can be caused by the same temperature contrast that powers a thunderstorm. As warm air rises through the colder air and causes an updraft that can start rotating, in the northern hemisphere where the tri-state tornado happened, a veering wind goes clockwise, but in the southern hemisphere, it shifts counterclockwise. The combination of a large thunderstorm with strong rotating winds is called a supercell. About one in a thousand storms becomes a supercell, and one in five or six supercells creates tornadoes. Supercells often result in tornado families that spawn multiple tornadoes. The duration of a tornado depends on its intensity, with the majority of them being weak and only lasting about two to three minutes. A strong tornado lasts about 8 minutes, while the average for violent tornadoes is closer to 25 minutes. Remember, the tri-state tornado was over 3 hours long. Most tornadoes form in the late afternoon, after the sun has heated the ground in the atmosphere enough to create thunderstorms. The tri-state tornado began at 1.01 p.m. near Ellington, Missouri, and finally ended at 4.30 p.m. by Petersburg, Indiana. Tornadoes can form at any time of the year, but are most common during tornado season, which starts in early spring in the American states along the Gulf of Mexico. The season and the tornadoes then swing into the north, meaning northern America American states will have more risk of tornado activity later in the summer. The region of the US that experiences most of the activity is known as Tornado Alley, and it includes South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Northern Texas, and Eastern Colorado. In America, tornadoes take 80 lives per year and cause over 1,500 injuries. At the time of the Tri-State Tornado, the Weather Bureau was tracking a cold, low-pressure system that bent down from Western Canada into Wyoming, Texas, and then Missouri. A warm front from the Gulf of Mexico raised the temperature in the area by 10 degrees, so warm air rushed upwards and caused an updraft as the merged storm system combined into a tornado-producing spiral as the sky went dark. A pillar of twisting air formed near Ellington, Missouri, and the tri-state tornado was alive. It claimed up to 13 lives in the first 83 minutes before crossing into Illinois, where it turned much deadlier. Outside the rubble of her schoolhouse in DeSoto, Illinois, Betty was one of the lucky students still alive. She couldn't find her siblings, and ran into the street to go home, and spotted a man she knew as Mr. Tippy, the owner of the town's restaurant. Relieved to see a familiar face, she desperately asked, Mr. Tippy? Did the world come to an end? He told the little girl, no, what they had just survived was a tornado. Mr. Tippy had no idea that the tornado would become infamous as the deadliest one to ever hit America, a title that it still holds today. He held his son in one arm and the little girl's hand in the other, and walked with her to the decimated town, where survivors were gathering to reunite with their families. At late dusk, Betty's mother Minnie and her father Martin arrived with little sisters Ruth and Elsie. Minnie and Ruth had been blown into a treetop and were mostly unhurt, but Elsie and Martin had suffered head injuries. Elsie was unconscious and passed away shortly after. Sadly, both Tina May and Marie had passed away at the school. Herschel, who had survived by diving under his desk when the teachers screamed for the students to save themselves, had recovered Marie's body and was still at the school to help. Their family home was destroyed, along with every other house in DeSoto. The tornado had claimed 69 lives, 33 of them children, and injured many more people. In Betty's class, 18 children were lost, and all but three boys in the room died because the boys were all less protected while shutting the windows. DeSoto lost 20% of their population on that first day, but the death toll didn't stop there. Some people, like their dad, Martin, succumbed to their injuries months after the tri-state tornado struck. Over near West Frankfort, Illinois, when Leela and her family finally got out of the basement, 
they saw nothing but destruction. The brand new family car had had its top torn off and was blown out of position from where they had parked it. Even the home, a large and sturdy house, had been turned on its foundation. The minute he went home, Leela's father began building a storm cellar and for years afterwards, he would collect the kids and take shelter every time a storm even began to form. But they never experienced anything like that tornado again. All these stories really blew me away, uh, uh, poor choice of words, but they made me wonder, what if something like this tornado happened again today? Would there be the same amount of damage and casualties? Well, after the devastation of the tri-state tornado, there was a shift in public awareness. People were on high alert, and tornado spotting networks sprang up in local communities. These programs saved lives and led to a quick decline in tornado deaths. Eventually, storm chasing became a hobby and even a career as people sought to learn more about tornadoes and witness them live. It's extremely sad that one key difference between then and now is that the US Weather Bureau actually had a ban on the word tornado since 1887. This was to prevent the public from panicking and since tornadoes were believed to be unpredictable, issuing warnings for them was seen as pointless. Forecasters weren't even allowed to study tornadoes or acknowledge them in public. This meant that the public wasn't aware of any possible danger and didn't recognize early warning signs. Weather tracking technology has also gotten much better since 1925, and tornado forecasting was born in 1948 after the Tinker Air Force Base was struck. A tornado ripped through the base on March 20th, throwing around several aircrafts and causing $10 million of damage, which is about $115 million today. This was the most damaging tornado ever recorded in Oklahoma. As a result, a general asked two meteorologists if they could explore tornado prediction, and just five days later, they noticed similar weather conditions and issued the first ever tornado forecast, saving the base from more damage. On March 18, 1925, the forecast for the central Midwest only called for some rain, cooling temperatures, and strong shifting winds, if the mentality at the time was to prevent as much damage as possible instead of preventing panic, it's possible many lives could have been saved. The ban on forecasting and mentioning tornadoes was lifted shortly after the first successful tornado prediction on the Air Force Base. So what would happen if a tornado like that happened today? Today, the focus is on saving lives and reducing injuries, since not much can be done about structural damage. We have several weather tracking organizations in North America, as well as more ways to instantly reach people, to issue warnings through an emergency alert system. The Storm Prediction Center is able to monitor weather conditions that have a high risk of storms and tornadoes, so it would have already highlighted the areas of concern and noted a high-risk warning for severe weather. By noon, a tornado watch would be issued for parts of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky. When a watch is issued, it means severe weather is possible during the next few hours. As the storm developed, local officers of the National Weather Services would issue tornado warnings for anywhere else that may be at risk. A warning means that severe weather has been spotted already or is expected within the hour. If you are sent a warning, it means to seek immediate shelter. Folks who live in a high-risk area should be sure to stay updated during severe weather, either through the radio, TV news channels, or on Online. If you do find yourself in an area with a tornado warning, it's safest to stay inside. Even if a tornado doesn't develop, strong winds, rain, and lightning can still be a harsh combination. Be sure to keep an eye out for signs that a storm will develop into a tornado, including severe thunderstorms, an extremely dark sky, and sometimes green or yellow clouds. Often, instead of rain, large hail will fall from the sky. Try to listen for rumbling, a loud roar and whistling sounds, and watch for a cloud shaped like a funnel or an approaching wall of debris. And sometimes, before a tornado hits, the wind may die and the air might suddenly get still. It's important not to waste time in a tornado. The best place to take shelter is in a basement, 
under a strong table or workbench. If there is no basement, a small interior room like a closet or bathroom is best, preferably one with thick walls away from windows. People are strongly encouraged to avoid windows at all costs, as the flying glass is extremely dangerous. People may be tempted to open windows and minimize glass damage, but the advice is not to waste time doing this and instead take shelter. Things like a mattress can be used for additional cover, and a heavy blanket can protect you from dust. It's vital to protect your head and neck. Even using your arms to shield them is better than nothing. People who live in mobile homes are most at risk, as they offer no shelter from even weak tornadoes. If you live in one, the advice is to take shelter in sturdy buildings. If that's not an option, taking cover in a ditch is better than staying in a mobile home. Cars are also not a safe place to shelter in during a tornado, as they can be tumbled over and even carried in the air, with people being thrown from them or blown through the windows. And if someone is caught in the open during tornado activity, it's best to stay low to the ground, in a culvert or a ditch if possible, and to hold onto a sturdy object like a tree stump. This is to prevent being tumbled along the ground and beaten up. As with most dangerous events, staying alert and knowing the risk factors, warning signs, and steps of safety significantly reduces your risk. If you live in an area that is used to tornadoes, you likely already know several of these warnings and actions to take. Have any of you experienced a severe storm or tornado? What was it like? Tornadoes may be scary, but we have a lot more resources and systems in place than the victims of the Tri-State Tornado did. Although the intensity, length, and duration of that tornado was remarkable, it might not have been the deadliest one in American history if there were better awareness and harm reduction practices at the time. Thankfully, we know a lot more than we used to about tornadoes and are safer than ever. Thanks again EcoFlow for sponsoring this episode. Head to our link in the description to visit EcoFlow's Green Energy Solutions.